Hey everybody, it's Chris, and today we're going to be reading chapters 8 and 9 of Stargirl. The change began around Thanksgiving. By December 1st, Stargirl Caraway had become the most popular person in school. How did it happen? Was it the cheerleading? The last football game of the season was her first as a cheerleader. The grandstand was packed. Students, parents, alumni. Never had so many people come to a football game to see a cheerleader. She did all the regular cheers and routines, and more. In fact, she never stopped cheering. While the other girls were taking breaks, she went on jumping and yelling. She roamed. Areas that had always been ignored, the far ends of the grandstand, the spectators behind the goalposts, the snack bar parents, found themselves with their own arm-pumping cheerleader. She ran straight across the 50-yard line and joined the other team's cheerleaders. We laughed as they stood there with their mouths open. She cheered in front of the player's bench and was shooed away by a coach. At halftime, she played her ukulele with the band. In the second half, she got acrobatic. She did cartwheels and backflips. At one point, the game was stopped, and three zebra-shirted officials ran toward one end zone. She had shinnied up a goalpost, tightrope walked out to the middle of the crossbar, and was now standing there with her arms raised in a touchdown sign. She was commanded down to a standing ovation and flashing cameras. As we filed out afterward, no one mentioned how boring the game itself had been. No one cared that the, ele that the electrons had lost again. In his column the next day, sport, the sports editor of the, Mar of the Micah Times referred to her as the best athlete on the field. We couldn't wait for basketball season. Was it a Hillary Kimball backlash? Several days after the birthday song, I heard a shout down the hallway. Don't. I ran. A crowd was gathered at the top of the stairwell. They were all staring at something. I pushed my way through. Hillary Kimball was standing at the upper, la the upper landing, grinning. She was holding Cinnamon the Rat, dangling by its tail over the railing, nothing but space between it and the first floor. Stargirl was on the space, look on the, on the steps below, looking up. The scene froze. The bell for the next class rang. Nobody moved. Stargirl said nothing, merely looked. The eight toes of Cinnamon's front paws slayed apart. Splayed apart. Its tiny, unblinking eyes were bulging, back, in, back black as cloves. Again, a voice rang out. Don't, Hillary. Suddenly, Hillary dropped it. Someone screamed, but the rat fell only to the floor at Hillary's feet. She sent Snargirl a final sneer and left. Was it Dory Dilson? Dory Dilson was a brown-haired brown ninth grader who wrote poems in a loose-leaf notebook half as big as herself and whose name nobody knew until the day she sat down at Stargirl's table for lunch. Next day, the table was full. No longer did Stargirl eat lunch or walk the hallways or do anything else at school alone. Was it us? Did we change? Why didn't Hillary Kimball drop the rat to its death? Did she see something in our eyes? Whatever the reason, by the time we returned from Thanksgiving break, it was clear that the change had occurred. Suddenly, Stargirl was not dangerous, and we rushed to embrace her. Call calls of Stargirl flew down the hallways. We couldn't say her name often enough. It tickled us to mention her name to strangers and watch the expressions on their faces. Girls liked her. Boys liked her, and most remarkable, the attention came from all kinds of kids, shy mice and princesses, jocks and eggheads. We honored her by imitation. A chorus of ukuleles strummed in the lunchroom. Flowers appeared on classroom desks. One day it rained and a dozen girls ran outside to dance. The pet shop at the Micah Mall ran out of rats. The best chance for us to express our admiration came in the first week of December. We were gathered in the auditorium for, for the annual Oratory for the annual oratorical contest. Sponsored by the Arizona League of Women Voters, the event was open to any high school student who cared to show his or her stuff as a public speaker. The microphone was yours for seven minutes. Talk about anything you like. The winner would move on to the district competition. Usually only four or five students enter the contest at MAHS. That year there were 13, including Stargirl. You didn't have to be a judge to see that she was far and away the best. She gave an animated speech, a performance really, titled Elf Owl, Call Me By My First Name. Her gray-brown homesteader's dress was the color of her subject. I couldn't see her freckles from the audience, but I imagined them dancing on her nose as she flicked her head this way and that. When she finished, we stomped on the floor and whistled and shouted for more. While the judges went through the, char the charade of conferring, a film was shown. It was a brief documentary about the previous year's state finals. It featured the winner, a boy from Yuma. The most riveting moments of the film came not during the contest, but during its aftermath. When the boy arrived back at Yuma High, the whole school mobbed him in the parking lot. Banners, cheerleaders, band music, confetti, streamers. Pumping his arms in the air, the returning hero rode their shoulders into school. 
The film ended, lights went on, and the judges proclaimed Stargirl the winner. She would now go on to the district competition in Red Rock, they said. The state finals would be held in Phoenix in April. Again and again, we whooped and whistled. Such was the acclamation we gave her in those last weeks of the year. But we also gave something to ourselves. Chapter 9 In the uh, Sonoran Desert, there are ponds. You could be standing in the middle of one and not know it because the ponds are usually dry. Nor would you know that inches below your feet, frogs are sleeping, their heartbeats down once or, down to once or twice per minute. They lie dormant and waiting, these mud frogs, for without water, their lives are incomplete. They are not fully themselves. For many months, they sleep like this within the earth. And then the rain comes, and a hundred pairs of eyes pop out of the mud, and at night, a hundred voices call across the moonlit water. It was wonderful to see, wonderful to be in the middle of, we mud frogs awakening all around. We were awash in tiny intentions. Small gestures, words, empathies, thought to be extinct, came to life. For years, the strangers among us had passed sullenly in the hallways. Now we looked, we nodded, we smiled. If someone got an A, others celebrated too. If someone sprained an ankle, others felt the pain. We discovered the color of each other's eyes. It was a rebellion she led, a rebellion for rather than against for ourselves, for the dormant mud frogs we had been for so long. Kids whose voices had never been heard before spoke up in class. Letters to the editor filled a whole page of the school's newspaper December edition. More than a hundred students tried out for the spring review. One kid starred, started a camera club. Another wore hush puppies instead of sneakers. A plain, timid girl painted her toenails Kelly green. A boy showed up with purple hair. None of this was publicly acknowledged. There were no PA announcements, no TV coverage, no headlines in the Micah Times. MAHS students astir. Individuality erupts. But it was there. It was happening. I was so used to peering through the lens, to framing the picture, I could see it. I could feel it in myself. I felt lighter, unshackled, as if something I had been carried, as if something I had been carrying had fallen away. But I didn't know what to do about it. There was no direction to my liberation. I had no urge to color my hair or trash my sneakers, so I just enjoyed the feeling and watched the once amorphous student body separate itself into hundreds of individuals. The pronoun we itself seemed to crack and drift apart into pieces. Ironically, as we discovered and distinguished ourselves, a new collective came into being. A vitality, a presence, a spirit that had not been there before. It echoed from the rafters in the gym, go electrons, it sparkled in the water fountains. At the holiday assembly, the words of the alma mater had wings. It's a miracle, I gushed to Archie one day. He stood on the edge of his back porch. He did not turn. He pulled the pipe slowly from between his lips. He spoke as if to, to Senior Segu Senor Seguaro or to the blazing mountains beyond. Best hope it's not, he said. The trouble with miracles is they don't last long. And the trouble with bad times is you can't sleep through them. It was a golden age, those few weeks in December and January. How could I knew? How could I know that when it, the end came, I would be in the middle of it? So now we just have a couple questions for chapters eight and nine. Our first question is, why did people start flocking to Stargirl? And our second question is, why did kids start to color their hair purple or paint their nails green? 